Hey, it's Mazzy here, and uh, we're going to continue talking about the ultimate collection, John Lennon, Plastic Ono Band, of course, with Yoko Ono and friends. Now, this is a continuation in a way, because you might want to look first at my not unboxing video. Basically, I hate unboxing videos. I think they're boring. Who needs to op open up a friggin' box on video and, and cut it open and take, you know, 35 minutes to do that? So, conceptually speaking, which is perfectly in line with, with this album and the whole uh, Plastic Ono Band concept, that was a, um, a showcase of what the album looks like, what the box looks like, what the double LP and the CD looks like. So check that out. There's a link below. And that's the initial um, when I received uh, that wonderful sort of preview of the album from uh, the John Lennon and Yoko Ono people. And I really uh, thank them for that. I've been listening to this uh, collection for a week. And what I'm going to do now is talk about this. John Lennon, Plastic Ono Band, The Ultimate Collection. Now, I'm a fan of box sets. We like the physical, conceptual thing. That's what I like about the artwork um, on some of these sets. Uh, that's the best thing that came out of the whole CD era, is all these fantastic collections and archives, in my opinion. I mean, I'm a big vinyl fan. The first video is in my vinyl room. As you can see, I'm no stranger to compact discs. I uh, prefer when I'm really listening in the moment to vinyl, although when you're listening to CDs and you're listening to Blu-rays especially, this is the way to go. And this is a fantastic set. Now, just to give you a little background on the Lennon Ono, Lenono boxes. Ono box. Now, unfortunately, my copy got ripped when I, long story, I need a new one. I need to find a new one of these. Um, I haven't really looked at it. This is a Royco disc box, Ono box, conceptual, beautiful set that Royco put out, God, was it 25 years ago? When was this? That has uh, versions of Yoko's music in different thematic orders. That's a fantastic set. And I love Yoko's music. Of course, there's the John Lennon Anthology, which uh, brings together outtakes, alternate versions, demos, which is a really fantastic set. If you want the basic collection in a beautiful box, uh, kind of designed by uh, Tom Rashawn at Capitol Records, as well as, uh, you know, Yoko's all over this, and I don't know all the details who designed once, but I think uh, Rashawn got the great aesthetic of what uh, Yoko and Sean were looking for, and this has the proper albums. How positive is that? <laughs> uh, this is the records, and of course, there's always, like with anything that Yoko conceptually does, there's a secret drawer in the bottom here, which we're not getting into that now. You can figure out what's in that by um, uh, looking at that. So, the ultimate box is like the great ultimate mixes and the ultimate box of Imagine that came out a couple years ago and last year's Give Me Some Truth, uh, the ultimate mixes. Now, ultimate mixes are something that is controversial to some people. And, and I know people say, why bother we have the original mixes? Now, I'm a first generation Lennon and Beatle fan, so I am used to this music for 50 plus years. You hear it, you get used to that. When you hear an aberration, it's interesting, you like it or you dislike it. Uh, when I talked about the Give Me, Sh uh, Give Me Some Truth box, I mentioned things I loved about it, and I, things that I thought the original uh, bested it. So that's a subjective thing. And what I mentioned in the uh, box opening that's not a box opening video is that I'm not a huge fan of the Sgt. Pepper remix or the Abbey Road mix, with some exceptions. But it's just because I think some of it's a little heavy-handed for my taste. But I did like the White Album remixes for the most part. But again, we all have different ears how we, when and how we came into this music. So that's something to consider. But I'm fine with these and these ultimate mixes. I mean, ultimate, do you have to call it ultimate? Because there's going to be another one maybe in 20 years, 30 years. Come on, Sean. You're going to want to play with these again? Maybe. Maybe not. This is an amazing set. Now... The ult I was surprised listening to the Ultimate Mixes on um, Blu-ray because as much as I liked maybe half of the Give Me Some Truth 
mixes. I liked almost every one of these mixes. I didn't, I didn't think they were a lot different, but I did think they were clearer. They're more um, in your face a little bit. And I don't mean that as a bad way. John Lennon's vocals are up in front a little more, but the music by um, no means is, is stuck way behind. What I really, what really stood out to me was Klaus Furman and Ringo Starr. The trio of John, Klaus, and Ringo are amazing. And, I, and I, it made me wanting more. It made me wanting like a whole album, like a rockabilly type album, which I'll get into when I talk about the jams here, of the three of them. I think they're brilliant. It's amazing what a great timekeeper Ringo is. I always knew this, but he is just so steady. He's not doing that the frills and the little wonderful bits he does with the Beatles on rain or or um, strawberry fields or anything. He just keep in time and he's like a, a, like a like clockwork. And both Ringo and Klaus, Klaus is the same way on bass, are just so minimal. They're not doing any fa anything fancy. They're not getting in the way. And it's just brilliant. I, I really like it a lot. Uh, those of you who don't know Klaus Vorman, he played bass with, uh, well, played bass with Manfred Mann for a while. He was a friend of the Beatles in Hamburg, and he designed the Revolver uh, cover, the artwork of a great, my favorite album cover, the Beatles Revolver, as well as the artwork for the uh, trilogy of the anthologies in 1995. The book is what makes it and adds to it. And I followed along for the last six days playing some of this record, uh, this combination, this box set several times. Some of it in more detail than others. And of course, there's the Blu-ray and there's the CD. So I'm really gonna go into the uh, music that's on the Blu-rays and not every track and not everything is detailed. But the whole idea of the Plastic Ono Band is this conceptual invention. I mean, invention's the wrong word, but you know, Yoko was part of the Fluxus movement of artwork in the early 60s and mid 60s, along with John Cage and so many others. And it was about the concept and a minimal performance. And what I want to show here from the book is this wonderful picture um, on the Plastigono band that really kind of epitomizes what this whole thing is about, is this. John Lennon really was excited by Yoko's idea of conceptual art and minimalism and the whole concept of performing and not being there. It's almost like what we have now with virtual reality and everything. It's kind of like it was a, a vision of what we're going through right now in technology. But putting these plastic devices, uh, creations, artistic, like acrylic sets on a stage with microphones and tape recorders and that is the band that's what you go to see that's what you go to hear and obviously it tweaked uh, Lennon's imagination and he came up he goes yeah we're good. we can talk we'll call it the plastic on a band and it goes from there it can be a, a conceptual band we can have different people involved we don't have to be this true entity like the Beatles that's this fixed thing obviously uh, the three singles that are on here that are great are Give Peace a Chance, which was the first single of the Plastic Ono Band, and of course, sported that great image. Like, what the fuck was that when that came out? I had no idea, but I, now I understand, and it makes total sense, and it's just great in the artistic sense of it. And of course, that was recorded in Montreal in a hotel room with Tommy Smothers and Petula Clark and all these other uh, hanger honors, uh, which is just a great single. Instant Karma and Cold Turkey are two perfect, intense, wonderful rock and roll singles. What's great in here is hearing the progress. Now, the Blu-ray contains in detail the Evolution mixes, the album and the singles, and the Evolution like uh, as sort of a documentary. Uh, Paul Hicks and Sean and Yoko took somewhat artistic license with the uh, Evolution documentary. They go, go through every single track on the album plus the singles and put together this many um, parts and pieces from various demos, takes, and versions, just so you can see the progression. Not unlike what Dylan does on a lot of his um, bootleg series records, where you hear the whole uh, progression of what a song ends up being like from the initial 
idea, the initial demo, or at least a initial studio workings to the final track. A lot of dialogue in that version, in the demo versions, excuse me, in the um, uh, documentary versions of the Element Mixes. It's really wonderful hearing John Lennon talk about this. And Ringo and Harrison at one point, I love that. This to me is what's magical about this set. And it is so exciting to see. It's like, like looking at oral v versions of Picasso's sketchbooks or something, or, or, or Da Vinci's sketchbooks of showing uh, the idea of flight or something. I just love this stuff. Now, he does this acapella version of Mother, which I earlier said is just bone chilling. It's really exciting. I love that. He talks about how he wants to, you know, back count it. How do we come up with this bell? I want this bell to open up, this church bell. We all know how that sounds. And the anguish at the end of that song, um, his primal therapy. Remember, this is the time, 1970, John and Yoko were going through primal therapy. It's a screaming therapy that you go through with Arthur Janoff was the creator of primal therapy and the screaming and, you know, they're getting off junk. I like that John has so much command of what he's doing here. He doesn't have the preciseness of a Paul McCartney, but he's got the soul of what he wants. He knows, he seems seemingly knows what he wants when he gets it. And he'll talk to Ringo about, on one track, he talks about, don't do that hi-hat, it gets in the way here. He's not talking down to Ringo, but Ringo's keeping the beat, and it, he just knows that it's messing him up uh, with the lyrics, and he can't hear that through his phones, I guess. And um, it's really interesting. A, a couple of other um, things that I really like. I love John's version of Hold On, the various versions, the workout versions, that great tremolo guitar. It's one of my favorite songs on this album, Plastic Ono Band album. And he plays his tremolo guitar, and there's one take in the uh, Evolution uh, documentary where instead of that moment where he says, cookie in the right channel, cookie, if you know the album, you know what I'm talking about. He just says, piss on a cow. I think we need to do a hashtag piss on the cow. That's going to be a thing that's going to be in my Instagram and hopefully it'll, um, <laughs> the world would be a better place because we'll have hashtag piss on a cow. I found out there's a great uh, evolution mix on that and he goes into this whole different rock and roll section which makes it a, almost a different part of the song that it, that wasn't used in the final version where it just changes the beat, changes the tempo. A lot of the songs, or a handful of songs, you see this evolution of how he changes the tempo and changes uh, the beat. Look at me, which is kind of great. I love Look at Me, and he's playing like a claw hammer guitar thing, which he played on Julia, and he actually talks about that. He talks about, oh, I played that on Julia, and I, you know, he's out of practice. You realize, you know, he hasn't done that, that kind of that little thing he did. I think that's kind of the uh, technique he learned, uh, him and Paul learned from Donovan um, in India, that guitar uh, picking style, McCartney too. And um, he says, I'm out of practice. I need to practice that for a few weeks before I do it. So I'm just going to, on the demo, I'm just going to strum it for a while. God. God is an incredible song. God is a concept by which we measure our pain. I don't believe. He's working it out. He's his acoustic guitar versions. He does his own piano versions. But of course, it really... What makes the song, aside from John Lennon's uh, personal intensity, is the gospel feel. You know John wanted that to be a gospel song. And John's not the sole gospel man. But bringing Billy Preston and doing that piano riff and that piano on God just makes that the ultimate great, you know, John Lennon gospel song, if there ever was one. You know, think of that year, a month before this album came out. This was a raw, intense album in December 1970. A month before this album comes out, all things must pass. Another gospel Beatle, uh, George Harrison, doing My Sweet Lord, also with Phil Spector, that over-the-top, magnificent wall of sound, which I think works on all things must pass. This is totally the opposite. It's kind of ironic, too, that Phil Spector produced this record because it, it is minimal. It is drier than what you'd expect uh, Phil to create. Um, and But it works. One thing that I think uh, stood out for me, and I'm trying to think if I knew this or not. I don't remember this. 
I don't think I knew that Phil Spector played the piano part in, in Love. Love is real, real is love. To me, that could have been the most cliche lyric, John Lennon. You know, give peace a chance, instant karma, all you need is love, love is, because there was that whole thing in the late 60s, love is, love is. It was the kumbaya thing. But John Lennon makes it work. He's brilliant the way he, he, he lyrically combines the simplest concept and makes it so beautiful. But Phil Spector's piano, I always thought it was Lennon, is beautiful in this. And there's an evolution uh, version, evolution documentary that has John playing an acoustic guitar, but has the entire beautiful Phil Spector piano piece, just alone, without any vocals. And it's stunningly beautiful. Just love that. I, I'm in awe of this album and what it took to create it. I won't go through every little um, version. I love Remember, it, you know, Remember starts off um, side two, and of course it ends up with Remember, Remember, the fish, 5th of November, which is Guy Fawkes Day, where they almost blew up uh, the Houses of Parliament. There's a little clip in the evolution at the end of that John talking about that, what that means. But in the, early on in that clip, he talks about he wants this explosion at the end. He wants uh, something at the end. Um, but it's a beautiful take. There's a weird uh, version of it where you hear slightly this Jews harp. Luckily, <laughs> he left that off. The Jews harp just doesn't work in that song, remember. But there are some really cool things. Um, in the Evolution mix, I recall, and I'm just kind of going by memory, there's a, a couple of versions. Oh, this is on the jam segment, which I'll say now because it's I don't see it as the jammy rock and roll stuff. He does a couple versions of um, I Don't Want to Be a Soldier, I Don't Want to Die that would later turn up on Imagine, one of my favorite intense. Just the drumming on that song is so great. Um, on Imagine, I, don't, I love I Don't Want to Be a sh Soldier, but there's a version of it that's sort of, almost like a country acoustic version. I never would have thought that song in that type of format, in that kind of genre, and it works. It makes me um, long for uh, Lennon uh, doing a cover uh, album that's more rockabilly, which I'll talk about when I get to the jams. It's great to see the tape boxes, the original tape boxes in the book. The book is a must, a compliment for this set, and it's great going through it. One of my favorite songs on the album also, uh, the last track on side one of the original album is Isolation. Beautiful song, beautiful lyrics, and I just die. I just melt every time I hear John's double track voice in that middle part. It is so great. It's Ringo, John Lennon, again, uh, Klaus Vorman. Again, those three are the core of this record. I, I, I just love, Klaus's bass playing is not fancy. Ringo's drumming is simple, but right on time, spot on. And John's piano playing and his vocals are so Ill intimate. But his double tracking, I tell you, when I listen to the um, ultimate mix of that on, from the Blu-ray version of it, and that came on, I yanked that up, I cranked that up, and it was, it was incredible, it was beautiful. And the versions, obviously, on the element mixes, hearing the different takes, hearing the different versions of that is, um, is, is pretty amazing. They also have the raw studio mixes, with, which are all the versions of the songs without any embellishment, kind of straight through. Uh, that's a fantastic listen. It's great to have that. Do we need that? Yeah, we, of course we do. Of course I do. I love that. I love having these pure ver versions of these. Literally, they're just taken off the tape, raw, no tweaking, no EQ adjustment, I don't think. The jams. Most of the jams are not complete songs. They're just literally what, <laughs> what you see it and what you hear is what you get. Jam sessions done during the sessions for this entire album, they kind of jumped into between songs. Maybe when they were bored for a while, they just needed to work themselves in a little bit of a tizzy and just go on to these great, you know, John Lennon's a great uh, fan of 50s and early 60s rock and roll. And of course, Johnny Be Good, Ain't That a Shame, Glad All Over, 
be faithful to me. Good night, Irene, you'll never walk alone. Um, Honey, don't, Matchbox, a few others. I love about this is, again, that core trio of Ringo, Klaus, and John. And it makes me, hearing this, and again, they're not finished, they're not polished, they're rough, they're incomplete. There is a um, Elvis parody of John doing a medley of Don't Be Cruel, Howl Dog, and When I'm Over You. And of course, he's like snarking it up. He's doing the over-the-top Elvis impersonation. And it's something he wouldn't necessarily release on a final album. But it just, it just you know, if you've heard the you know, tapes and, and outtakes from obviously Get Back, Let It Be sessions and uh, any chatter in the studio. John, John was a bit of a wanker and a humorist and the whole influence of the of his speak, talk, talk, speak gibberish like from The Goon Show and that as as seen in, and read in his book in his own right and the Spaniard in the works. He is such a wit and is so great about that. But hearing these jams make me makes me wish in this time, right in 70, 71, that those three would have done like a rockabilly album. I know several years later, John did the rock and roll album with Phil Spector. For me personally, that rock and roll album is an attempt to do, you know, his core. And to me, it's mostly a failure. I like Stand By Me. I think the production, because with the horns and all that stuff, gets too much. Phil Spector obviously produced some great early rock and roll records, but that to me misses this. When I hear these jams, it, I wish John and Klaus and Ringo, maybe with one other guitar player, not George, we don't want it to be too beatles had done a rockabilly record. in, the, in Like the early Sun Session stuff of uh, Johnny Cash and and uh, you know Carl Perkins and that, because there's a really intimate, in your face, direct, minimal sound that it's it, it kind of gives you a little teaser of what could have been. And as I said earlier on, they do a version there of I Don't Want to Be a Soldier, that's kind of rockabilly. That could have been a cool cut, a couple of original tracks mixed in with some classics there. I mean, again, a rockabilly album by John would have been so fucking fantastic. And lastly, I'm going to close out with the Yoko Ono Plastic Ono Band Live Sessions. I'm a big fan of this album and Yoko's work. And I said that in my uh, not box opening conceptual video. This is a uh, secretly Canadian uh, label reissue of that first uh, Yoko Ono record, Plastic Ono Band on Compact Disc, which is a fantastic record. What's really interesting about this record, and I, I, t I mentioned this a little bit in my um, Not Box opening video, is that they recorded like basically one day in about 30 minutes or maybe a little more of recordings where they jammed and they um, they actually took one earlier track a couple years earlier with Ornette Coleman, the great uh, avant-garde out there jazz saxophone player. But they went to the studio and sometimes John and Ringo and Klaus were just doing these riffs, just doing like jams. Yoko comes in and does her thing. I'm a fan of it. It's conceptual. What I said on the earlier video, and I'll, to this day, I want people to understand, if you're into the B-52s, if you're into Throbbing Gristle, if you're into Sonic Youth, if you're into um, the Gang of Four, the post-punk thing, all those artists and all those bands were influenced by Yoko Ono, Nina Hagen, uh, Susie and the Banshees. Now, some people may not like the style Yoko presents it, but she was the original and she influenced. This is proto-punk music. This is out there music. This is esoteric noise in a way. And, and, and there, legitimately, there's an audience that won't ever like that music and don't won't get that music and that's fine that's fine i applaud yoko and john putting themselves out there with this stuff and she got bashed way too long in my opinion and because it's not a music it's not a sound for everybody but if you invest in those kind of bands if you're a fan of sonic youth just in the last year alone kim gordon the bass player singer former singer of sonic youth did an album that it's when it was one of my favorite albums of last year. And it's got that 
thrashy, noisy sound that, that Yoko does on this album. But what's amazing about this, and I did mention this in the other uh, video, and I don't take it lightly, and I am serious. This reminds me of what Miles Davis did with a couple of his albums with Teo Maceo. Teo Maceo, if you don't know, because I know a lot, a lot of Beatle people are probably watching this who aren't into jazz and aren't into avant-garde and aren't into that funky uh, period of Miles Davis from Bitches Brew in a silent way. In a silent way from 1969 uh, and uh, Bitches Brew from 1970, Miles Davis went in with all these musicians. It just jammed. They played different things. They went on uh, riffs with John McLaughlin, with um, uh, Chick Corea, with all these, uh, Tony Williams, all these different uh, drummers and artists and keyboard players, and just jammed. Tail Maceo, the producer, cut it up to make it a presentable, those presentable records. He did that several times. I think On the Corner was another one in 72 where he did that with. That's what... Classic Ono band, Yoko Ono, is all about. Parts and pieces cut together, jams with Yoko, cut together to make a series of songs to make a brilliant album. Yoko Ono, Plastic Ono Band, the live sessions is just that. Basically, just the sessions. Not cut up, necessarily put together. It's on the Blu-ray only, so you have to play it on the Blu-ray to get this. It's just an amazing outburst of creativity. They would be playing in the studio, Yoko might be in the control room, would come in and join in, or Yoko and would start something, start some vocal sound, and then they would go in and uh, play music to add on to that. I find this collection a beautifully intense set. It's, it's emotionally raw, it's musically raw, but it's very successful. It, there's a great essay here. Yoko Ono, what is the relationship between the world and the artist? So again, John and Yoko, Plastic Ono Band, John Lennon, The Ultimate Mixes, The Ultimate Collection. Fantastic set, a fantastic artist statement. It comes with a couple of postcards. Who are the Plastic Ono Band? And of course, the Plastic Ono Band. I hope you like this. Please comment on this. Um, you gotta hear the stuff with their own ears. Unfortunately, I can't really do clips here, but it doesn't matter, that would take some time. Listen to this, crank this music up when you have the chance. I applaud them uh, doing this series. I certainly hope they continue. We want a Walls and Bridges, yes. We want a Sometime in New York, yes. Let's hear some stripped down versions of that. We want Double Fantasy and the whole 1980, you know? Yes. Mind games. Yes, we want them all. Of course we do. We're greedy. We're selfish bastards. But we love you. Uh, Mazzy loves you. Mazzy loves John, Yoko, Sean. Thanks again for watching. Uh, please put your comments in the bottom. And um, we'll see you next time.